Hello, everybody, and welcome to Nature Drawing. My name is James Sisti. I'm a professional artist, wilderness guide, and I'm also a nature drawing instructor. Today's class is going to be a good overview of what we do uh, with Hike and Draw. We have a wonderful online drawing program that's been evolving over the course of the past six months, and we do everything from uh, beginner drawing to landscapes, botanical drawing, and more. So without further ado, today's class, we're going to be talking about our goals. Uh, we're going to be going over what is needed to participate in this lovely hobby. Then we're going to talk about getting started. Uh, we'll have a warm-up exercise that we'll participate in. Uh, we'll go into uh, a brief landscape drawing, some nature journaling, and again, you'll get a nice taste of what we do here at Hike and Draw. Uh, finally, I'll conclude with some announcements, and uh, then we will be able to take what we learn in class today out into the field. And that's what it's all about, right? So when we talk about our goals, we're thinking about how we can get a deeper connection with nature. There's so many things that we tend to miss when we get out and you know, participate in a hike or visit a park. And really the, the nice thing about drawing is that it gives you two really important things. It gives you intention and it gives you focus. And when you combine those two elements through art, you're able to learn more and observe more about the natural world around you. And another benefit of combining art and nature is that you get to share your observations and the things that you learn with other people. So it's a really great positive habit that feeds into itself, uh, a great combination of creativity and learning. So to get started, you really don't need a lot of stuff, really. I, I participate in this all the time. I have a sketchbook, a pencil, and a pen. That's it. That's all you need. No, no uh, heavy investment there. Uh, anything else that you bring out with you is considered bonus material, things like colored pencils, watercolor, uh, specimen containers, if you're more of a naturalist. Um, really, it, it takes only uh, a piece of paper and a pencil to get started, and that's pretty much what we're going to be using today. Um, so before we get started with our drawing, really quick, the idea of beginning this type of a hobby or doing this type of a practice is it's, it's for you. It's a way for you to explore the things you're interested in about nature. And whether that's birds, plants, insects, fossils, you name it, that's the kind of focus, that's the kind of passion that drives our focus and, and has our curiosity uh, leading us on new journeys every single time. So that may lead you into uh, all these different other subcategories that you may not have known about before and it's a really great way to, um, to cultivate your practice of nature drawing. So I have a quick warm-up exercise for everybody here. I'm going to teach you the foundational technique, which we use in all of our classes. And this technique is going to be very interesting because everybody can do it, okay? It's not going to be intimidating. So the idea is I have a top-down camera that I'm going to be sharing with you right now. And you're going to be able to see what I'm drawing, okay? So here is my piece of paper, my pencils, and uh, eraser and a pencil sharpener, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and clear the board here. And if you're working with an eight by 10 piece of paper, I invite you to fold it in half like this. We're gonna maximize our paper use today, all right? So here is our regular sheet of paper. And really the, the idea of, of an intimidating blank page can immediately be dispelled by starting your drawing with the box. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna create an outline. This is going to define our drawing area, but it's also gonna give us a space to write notes in, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. Another great thing about this is we can use this box as a sort of measuring tool, and I'll tell you more about that in a minute too. So here we have a piece of paper folded in half with a rectangle, okay? What we're going to do, and I'm gonna share my screen really fast with you, is we're going to take a look at this reference tool, this reference drawing here, okay? Now, this is a fir cone. When we think about the Christmas tree, right? Tis the season, we're always considering our Christmas trees to be pine trees. Well, they're, they're mostly fir or spruce trees. And uh, reason being, it's just a more, it's a fuller type of foliage. You can see how these leaves, these little um, leaflets, 
grow around in a spiral. That's, that's known as a world, W-H-O-R-L-E-D, a world arrangement, okay? That means it goes 360 degrees around the branch. So we're gonna be focusing on this cone right here. So this is a Douglas fir, which is um, kind of a, a weird thing to call the tree because it's not actually a fir tree. It's actually named after an, uh, a very famous Scot Scottish naturalist uh, by the last name of Douglas, but nonetheless, we're gonna go ahead and draw this cone right here. So I invite you to open up that reference photo that I sent you so that you can have that open because I wanna share my top-down camera with everybody so that we can learn the technique. Okay, so everybody in this room, in this virtual room, has something in common. You can all draw a dot, okay? And that's how we're gonna start. Let's consider right now the allocation of space in our rectangle. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw a line right down the middle. So I'm gonna divide my box in two. I have a left side and a right side. Okay, now we're gonna use the left-hand side to draw our picture and we're gonna leave this right-hand side blank for a minute, okay? Now, when I'm looking at this Douglas fir cone, I'm gonna start by sizing it up and creating a space which is accurate in proportion. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at the length and I'm gonna guesstimate the length. I'm not gonna have an exact figure. So I'm gonna put a dot for the top and a dot for the bottom. That's the length of the cone. Next, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a dot on either side, which is going to be indicative of the width. So we have the height and the width relatively figured. It doesn't have to be an exact science. That's okay, no pressure there. So we start with these dots because everybody can make them. It's the simplest form of mark making. So let's think about what it would be like if we were to create an outline of the subject we're looking at right now. There's a lot of different things happening texture wise. So only focus on the cone. Don't worry about the branches behind the cone. So I'm gonna start with the top and I'm going to begin Oh, is my picture not focused? Let me go ahead and try to get that camera adjusted again. Is that better? Cool. Okay, so what I'm gonna do, we have our four dots here, and I'm gonna go ahead and start by creating a dot matrix. We're gonna think like architects right now, not like artists, because this is our planning phase. We wanna plan what we're going to draw before we actually do the drawing part. This is what's going to be a, This is what's going to enable you to create an accurate drawing. Okay, so blueprint first. Okay, so I'm just making a dot matrix. Okay, and and I'm not. I'm ignoring some of the details here on purpose because I want to begin with a simplified form to build on top of. Again, thinking like an architect. So there is a lot of scales, right? And there's a lot of interesting little, um, these are seeds. These are, these are like little Samoras that are coming off the side. So we're gonna, we're, if you're looking at the picture and you see those little um, feathery bits that are hanging off, that's what I'm talking about. So I didn't include that in the initial uh, blueprint. Instead, we have pretty much what is an oval. Next, what we're gonna do, once you have your oval, oval figured, is we're gonna go ahead and we're going to start by just noticing from the top, or we're only focusing at the top right now, how these scales overlap with each other. So there's one scale that's very, very prominent in the front, which I'm gonna use as my focus, okay? Just like that across the top. Now it has a neighbor that's not as prominent, okay? And then there's one that's a little bit on top of it, okay? So I'm doing this with the dot matrix again because we're still planning our drawing. We're not technically drawing yet. Okay, I'm noticing how some of the scales flake off to the side and I'm going to begin by sort of deconstructing the figure of this specimen because there are overlapping scales. So this is our main one that we're gonna always come back to. This is our focus here. Notice how in the center of this one scale, if you look in the middle, we're gonna have another scale come out from underneath. It almost looks like a suit of armor, 
like some scale nail, right? So then this one has another piece that overlaps. And you can see how it's kind of a repetitive pattern, right? We're noticing how this particular piece, this particular specimen grows because we're paying very, very close attention to the formation of these scales, right? Now, don't worry if it's not super accurate. That's not the point. The point is just to look at the subject and to notice these things about it, right? And you can see how these little feathery bits kind of come off to the side just like that. Okay, we have these nice looking feather parts. And let's actually go ahead and, and add some of those to the top as well. It doesn't have to be an exact number. It doesn't have to be exactly as it is in the picture, but just enough to replicate what you're observing in nature, okay? And you can see that these little feathery bits are very similar to the needles or the, or the, or the foliage that's growing on the branches around it. You know, it makes sense, right? So we have this sort of crown formation on the top, which is where this cone is connected to the branch, okay? And in all this time, what we're doing is we're building our familiarity. We're making a relationship, essentially, with this particular specimen because we're spending so much darn time looking at it. Okay? And that's what it takes, really. It takes time to hone in on these key details. So what do we do once we get this particular part finished, right? Well, what I, what I like to do is sort of sprint ahead and just get the outline done because we're going to progress quite quickly in just a little bit. Okay, so I'm only going to worry about right now what's happening on the perimeter or the outline of this cone. And you could either walk down one side or alternate back and forth. And eventually what we're gonna have is a nice contour for us to trace over with our lines, okay? We're still using the dots here. It's a, again, a very non-intimidating way to draw because we're, we're still planning. We're not technically drawing yet. And this is the hardest part. Once you get finished with the planning phase, the drawing part's gonna be a breeze. And you're gonna be able to apply this formula to drawing any type of subject, whether it's a animal or a uh, landscape or even somebody's pet or a relative. <laughs> you can do this with faces as well. But the idea of, of getting, the, uh, getting the proportions right and, and understanding the form of the specimen it takes the most brain power. It's going to feel mm -hmm. like you're lifting weights with your mind, so to speak. Okay? So I'm just dancing around the outer edge. I'm looking and I'm seeing almost a silhouette of what this particular object is. So I'm not worried about the interior just yet. Okay? When we're done with this, just plotting out these coordinates here, we're gonna draw, we're gonna make lines, we're actually gonna get the drawing part started and it's gonna go super fast, okay? And if you feel like you're, you're having a little trouble keeping up, don't worry. Like I said, I'm recording this workshop so you can always rewatch it later. If you feel more comfortable watching first and drawing later, that's totally fine. It's not a race. Okay, so here I have an outline, okay? Completely constructed out of dots. I understand based on the initial work I did on the top that I'm gonna be dealing with some overlapping uh, elements here, but we'll worry about that in a minute. I wanna to talk to you about drawing now, okay? Now that we've done our architecture, we did our due diligence, we're ready to begin our drawing. And just because this blueprint is here doesn't mean you have to trace it literally. If there's something that's slightly off, you don't need to waste time or, or worry about erasing, just draw next to it. Okay, so for example, I'm going to begin by tracing these little feathery looking things, okay, that are on the top, the head of this fur cone. Okay, and look how quick it goes, just because we did the, we took the time to plot everything out accordingly. Okay, again, everybody can draw a dot. Okay, now we're using our blueprints, right? Because we we had our architect's hat, architect hats on earlier. We're tracing our blueprints. And that's giving us a nice, accurate representation of what we're seeing here. Okay? And again, you don't have to trace it perfectly. Just enough to follow the guidelines. Okay? 
So here we have a nice guideline set up, right? And the nice thing is, once if, if you actually do trace over it directly, you're, you're, you're sort of getting rid of the dots by drawing on top of them, okay? No erasing required. Okay, we have this feathery element coming off the side, but then we have this little flake here. And just take a look and see, based on your planning, if it feels right, if it feels accurate. Because the more you, you look at your reference, the more true your drawing is going to be, okay? There we go, get that nice feathery bit there. Just worried about the, out, the outline right now. And then as you connect in, right, you know, as you connect these lines, you're gonna start noticing where pieces fit together, kind of like a puzzle, okay? And your mind is able to interpret all this complex information more efficiently because, again, you took the time to notice the little subtleties that are happening, okay? And I'm just gonna start pinching in here because as we, as we start our outlining process, we're giving ourselves a map to follow. Naturally, we think from left to right. So the idea of starting on the outer perimeter and working your way in gives you the advantage of um, essentially building piece by piece rather than trying to tackle the whole thing at once, which is what I find is the most intimidating part about drawing. Okay, breaking it down into smaller pieces, planning it carefully, using a dot matrix to sort of give yourself a blueprint to follow. That's the way we do it here. Okay, and just kind of come in a little bit, follow what you're noticing through your observations. Okay, and slowly but surely, you're gonna be able to create enough of a, of a trail for you to follow, figuratively, of course, for you to have a completed drawing. Now, it's a simple line drawing, right? We're not worried about shading, we're not worrying about color right now, and that's sort of the nice part, is you get to choose when enough is enough, right? Just because a drawing isn't colored or shaded doesn't mean that it, it's, unfinished, right? If, if you're happy with a line drawing, then that's it. You're done. You know, and the idea of sort of putting yourself in a, a, a peaceful mindset, in a, in a focused mindset, you're actually giving yourself quite a biological boost here because you're making your brain stronger. You're, you're working with your observational skills and uh, your brain is building neurons. Just like if, uh, for example, you ever hear the term muscle memory? This is usually applied to things like uh, musicians or athletes. Muscle memory, the more you do it, the easier it feels. Well, that's because your brain is building these little neuron pathways in, uh, in the gray matter area, you know, and that's, that's what's allowing you to become not only a better observer, but a better artist. Okay, so it's actually quite healthy for you. And notice too how we're, we're working our way around, we're, we're starting on the outside, and then when it gets narrow, when it's easy to connect part A to part B, the left to the right, you're just sort of on autopilot, you're filling in those details in the middle, you know, because we're tempted to take one big chunk all at once. And that's what really kind of gets us frustrated is that we're not really thinking about the natural flow of things here. When we do it this way, however, we're coming in prepared, right? We're observing what we need to observe, and that's setting us up for success. Okay, so I'm just adding these little feathery bits because this is a, a, a cone that opens up and these little feathery parts blow away and they're carried by the wind. And that's how those seeds are transported over um, distance so that the trees can reproduce. Okay. And some of these cone-bearing trees actually require an immense amount of heat in order to open up and release the seeds. So although I'm sure all you Californians can agree, forest fires are, are detrimental to, to uh, us in the, in the civilized world, sometimes out in nature, it's the only way in which trees can reproduce. But then there's overkill, which <laughs> we're all duly familiar with now. <laughs> Okay, so I'm just getting up to the top portion over here. I'm gonna start thinking about wrapping this drawing up. 
Okay. Very carefully, just following the, the trail. Okay, finishing this contour outline here, keeping my eye on the reference piece. And it's always great. I encourage people to draw from nature to actually have the, the physical specimen with them. As long as you're not hurting anything, as long as you're not you know, killing a tree or a, or a plant in order to bring it home. Uh, I typically find all of my specimens on the forest floor or out in the backyard once they've already come off the tree. And um, autumn is a particularly good season for collecting specimens. And the benefit of drawing from 3D versus drawing a photograph is that you're, you're kind of tasked with a different type of uh, mental exercise, which I enjoy. It's good to challenge yourself. So I'm just gonna go ahead and, and fill in the rest of this here because that's, you know again, starting from the outside, we had our four dots, right, for length and width. We, we created an outline using dots and then we started plotting our coordinates before connecting the lines. And now that I've connected the lines on the exterior of this object, it's making the connections very, very apparent for me on the interior. So it's giving me a more accurate representation of what I'm seeing here, and it's, it's making my life uh, as the artist a lot easier, okay? And if there are parts of it that aren't 100% accurate, don't worry about it. No one's judging, that's okay. Okay, and just following down here, you can use pieces of the nature object as a measurement tool. For example, if you're noticing certain intersections, you can tell where the other intersections are going to be and how they connect with different parts of the specimen as a whole. And I'm just noticing now that these feathery-like seeds are, are alternating, they're interspersed in a very deliberate way. You know, this is millions of years of evolution that has caused these uh, plants to uh, grow this way. So it's just nice to know that um, because even if you're not 100% accurate, if you're following that particular guideline, of alternating seeds here, you're technically following the rules of nature. You're understanding and you're observing something that could be um, quite accurate. So I'm gonna go ahead and just extend this little fellow up a little bit. Okay, and then this seed pod sort of ends there and it overlaps here and we have a specimen, okay? So, we could also you know, spend some time drawing the branch that it's attached to. We don't really need to, to worry about that right now. But the idea of leaving this side of the page blank is essentially we're gonna, we're gonna turn this little field sketch of ours into something that has some um, actual scientific relevance here, okay? So what do I mean by that? Okay, let's talk about data. There are certain observations that anybody can make, regardless of whether you're a scientist or not, that actually contain scientific relevance. You know, you don't need a PhD in biology in order to be a contributor to the world of science. So we're, what we're gonna do is we're gonna add our first piece of data, which is the date, okay? Today is December the 12th, 2020, okay? And let's pretend that we're all on an imaginary hike with each other. Let's just say that we're, um, Let's say we're in California, all right? Shoot, shout out a, a park in California you want us to be in right now. Yosemite. Yosemite. All right. So we're in Yosemite. Y-O-S-E-M-I-T-E. -S -E -E. Okay, I think that's how you spell it. Yosemite. <laughs> so we're in Yosemite National Park in California. Okay, this is our second piece of data because it's giving us a, a location. So we have a timestamp, a location, okay? Um, and th this is our, our beginning of identifying this as a, as a scientific study. So the subject that we've drawn right now is a Douglas fir cone. So Douglas fir cone, okay?
what's a good trail name in Yosemite? I've never been. Vernal Falls. How do you spell that? V-E-R-N-A-L, Falls. Vernal Falls, beautiful. Is there Douglas fir in the Yosemite? Well, it's a West Coast tree. Uh, these are typically found either in the Rocky Mountains, California. Oh, Vernal, thank you. <laughs> or, uh, or on the West Coast in the, in the north, northern regions. But um, we're going to say for today's exercise, yes. <laughs> Vernal with a V, got it. Okay, so we found this Douglas fir cone at Vernal Falls. Okay, so now we have a more specific location because Yosemite is a big place. So what are, what are some other baseline data points we can add? If we wanna get more information dense, what we could do is we could add measurements, right? Let's say we found it on the floor and we have our, tasty ta our, our trusty tape measure in our pocket. Let's just say that the, the, the length and the width, and we're gonna go with inches. So I'm sorry for all of our friends who adore the metric system. Uh, so let's say the length is about four inches and the width is about two inches, okay? Now we're getting granular. So we're, we're giving ourselves the, the measurements here, okay? And what's the point of doing this? Well, let's say you make a habit of it. Doing it once isn't, you know, isn't, a, isn't a, a bad thing, but let's say you go and you do this every time you go hiking, okay? And you're gonna go ahead and you're gonna do this every, every once a week for, the, for an entire year. You're gonna be able to pull this data together and you're gonna say, okay, let's say compared to Uh, I'll, I'll say, let's, let's pick an October date. So compared to the 1010 hike, cones are no longer green. Seeds are now presenting. Okay, so what you're doing is you're comparing your sketches and your observations from previous hikes, and now you're starting to sort of become an expert on the Douglas fir cone in Yosemite National Park. And no, nothing's stopping you from putting this all together in some sort of a formal way, either a spreadsheet or uh, maybe a little book of observations, and handing it to the department at the park and saying, hey, these are my observations on the development of the Douglas fir cone. And um, you know what? Since there were a lot of fires in California this past year, it might be very useful information for, for them to know where are their denser populations of this tree and how might we be able to use this data to reforest areas that have been completely destroyed by the fires, right? Very dramatic example, but you know, this is the kind of thing that you can do and you don't need a, a degree in biology to do this. So a great combination of direct observation, sketching, and data is a great tool for your artist's toolkit for the next time you go out and hike. And you can do this with birds, you can do this with other kinds of uh, plants. It's all up to you. That's why it's great to pick an area of focus that you find particularly exciting. Great. So we're gonna move on into our next exercise here. And we're gonna build on this foundation to create another drawing, okay? so. This is again gonna be emailed to you at the conclusion of the workshop. So don't worry if, you, if you're trying to catch up and finish by the end, don't worry. We're gonna talk about landscape drawing, okay? Now, landscape drawing uses the same kind of principles, right? Where we're gonna be starting with dots and everything, but the measurement's gonna be a little bit different. And that's where we're gonna use our margin uh, a little bit more uh, to our advantage here. So this is the second, um, reference photo. Let me just let it load. There it is. This is the second reference photo that we're going to be using. Okay, so I invite you to download this from the chat and open it up on the side as well so you can watch the camera and have the reference. But before we draw this, I want to talk about 
a basic art concept called visual hierarchy. And if you've been in my classes before, you've seen this slide. Basically what we're talking about is what is the focus of the drawing, right? So for example, this is a photo I took in Mount Rainier National Park. I, I took a picture of these flowers that were blooming and beautiful, and they just so happened to be in front of Mount Rainier, right? Now, although Mount Rainier is, not, is in this picture, it's technically a picture of the flowers, not a picture of Mount Rainier. So that's why everything is in focus in the foreground. And as we reach the horizon in the treetop, things are sort of blurry and out of focus. That's because the visual hierarchy of this photograph is composed to favor the flowers, okay? So that's the same thing. Like for example, if uh, we have this little sketch here, we have these big trees in front of this uh, sort of amorphous, generic looking um, you know, texture of rock and mountain in the background. We're, we're establishing a visual hierarchy with the trees. We're looking at the trees and this stuff just kind of happens to be in the background. So that's kind of the idea, okay? So as we begin this drawing, let's go ahead and I'll invite you to just take that piece of paper that you folded in half and flip it over. Okay, so we're still using the same piece of paper here and we're gonna do exactly what we did to start our drawing before. We're gonna start with a rectangle. Now this rectangle, although it's a great way to I, define the space you're gonna be drawing in, it's a great place to leave room for notes, it's also going to be used as a measurement tool. And I like this technique because it gives you a way to keep control over your composition, okay? So here is our rectangle. And what we're gonna do next is by focusing on that reference photo. Let's all take a look at this reference photo again, okay? Focusing on this reference photo, if we were to divide the page in half from left to right, the majority of this side of the page is gonna be these beautiful uh, spruce trees. Okay, you got the sunshine coming through, very dramatic. We have a frozen lake, okay? And then on the other side of the, of the drawing, we're gonna have these mountains in the background. And notice how the mountains are sort of faded and the trees are darker. There's a higher contrast with this tree line here. That's what we're gonna focus on. And I'm gonna teach you not only how to draw individual trees, but we're also gonna work on drawing mountains and uh, drawing forest or groups of trees, okay? So let's go ahead and dive right in. I'm gonna go ahead and share my top-down camera now. All right, so you can go ahead and draw that line very, very lightly down the middle of your page so that you can barely see it, okay? And now let's talk about how to use this margin as a reference, as a uh, measuring tool, starting on the left-hand side of the page, okay? So looking at the ground, looking at the bottom left-hand corner of the reference photo, we're gonna notice that there's a little line going across, right? That's, that's a, an area where the ice melt is meeting the lake. And you have a little bit of space between where this lake is starting to be exposed and you have uh, the ice, which is about this tall. So I'm gonna leave a little mark there. This is where the, the, the ice meets the forest, right? So the forest is actually going to be kind of tall. So if I notice where the top of the tallest tree is on the, on the left-hand side of the margin, I'm gonna be able to make a little note here, a little tick mark, just like that. This is where the tallest tree is gonna be. It's not gonna be taller than that. Okay, so I've divided or allocated, basically, my space for where this is, in between these two lines is gonna be forest. Okay, and from here down is going to be a body of water. Okay, so if I were to go ahead and just very, very quickly, and, and you can use dots or you can draw a line, whatever you're more comfortable with, start to walk my way from the left hand side of the page all the way to the right hand side of the page, keeping in mind that little reference mark that I made earlier on the margin. And you could do the same thing on the right hand side as well. Notice where the page ends right here, okay? And the lake just kind of collides right into this part of the margin. Well, the trees on this side of the page are gonna be much shorter than the trees on the left-hand side of the page. 
In fact, if I use the margin as a measuring tool, they're about this tall. Okay, so I'll leave a little mark there. And this is where I'm gonna begin growing my tree line because it's going to ascend from, from right to left. It's going to ascend upward because this is where the tallest trees are. Now let's talk about those mountains too, right? We have this tree line defined quite clearly. Okay, and I'm just gonna go ahead and walk my way back across the page. And I'm making these random dots here because it isn't just a straight line. These trees have texture, they have character, they vary in size, and they also vary in the amount of foliage that they have. Also notice that the tree line gets a little bit thinner as you get closer to the camera. We're gonna, we're gonna make these little pyramid looking marks here, just very rough, very loose, don't think too much into it, that are going to represent the individual trees. Okay, these are all clustered together. Okay, so don't worry if it is a little rough and loose right now, that's fine. This is gonna be our tree line. Now the mountains, if we go from the right hand side, okay, right where we see the tree line crash into this margin here, where does the mountain crash into the side? Okay, so we go up a few inches here, two inches or so, let's say, and there's the first mountain that crashes into the side. And it's very steep. It's like a, almost like a crescent that starts from the tree line and all the way up into the, boom, into the margin here. And then above that, this is the tallest part of the mountain. Um, I'm gonna make a little tick mark there. And we have a, a peak that sort of comes up over here and crashes into another peak. Okay, where does that peak start? Let's take a look. We have this mark here for this dome looking formation. And then if we move in just so slightly, we're gonna see this sort of conical mountain, this cone-shaped mountain emerge, okay? And it collides with this mountain here, so that's exactly what we want. It emerges, okay? And we just follow the line, follow the line across the page to where it disappears behind the trees, okay? So again, we think like architects first and artists second, right? We have our blueprint for the drawing that we're about to do, okay? So what we're gonna do first is the simplest thing, is we're gonna return to the bottom of the, of the page and really look at where the land meets the water here, okay? And this is also a great opportunity to make holiday cards for people and your family, by the way. <laughs> so just FYI, if you wanna get more bang for your buck, you can mail this to somebody. <laughs> All right, so the idea is we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna start with our connect the dots process. I just want you to note though, that there are two land masses, okay? Because it looks like there's a sort of peninsula that juts out. Um, we're gonna use the margin as our measuring tool again. So let's go to the bottom right hand side and look at where the, the forest crashes into the side of the margin on the bottom, right? Right where the lake and the forest meet. And I'm gonna say like somewhere around here, we're gonna be dealing with two different land masses. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna quickly make a little note here, just like this, like a little jutting feature that's going to tell me, okay, this is gonna be further back than this, okay? And one way I can help to really drive that point home is to just add a little, little grove of trees here just like that. This is gonna this is gonna represent trees in a little bit. Don't worry about it looking like trees or not right now. Okay. So there we go. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna make sure that this little feature juts out just like this, and I'm gonna connect all the way back. And again, you don't have to trace the dots exactly. Kind of arcs, just like that. Boom. Okay. And then the, the land mass that's behind this peninsula will start up here and go boom, just like that into the side. So one thing I like to do in order to establish the borders between land and water, okay, is I'll go ahead and make a thick line like that. Okay, not pressing too, too hard. And then I'll take my sharp, I have a sharp pencil on the side, but just sharpen your pencil. and. Um, don't be afraid to move your drawing around if it's, if it's uncomfortable for you to draw like this, okay? So what I like to do is with a sharp point, I'll go ahead and I'll draw a thinner line 
and break it up a little bit. Not, not so that it's just dashes, but you want a series of thinner lines that are following where the land meets the water. And that's gonna help give you the impression of where the land meets water, right? And we have a lot of texture here. Like we have some interesting, and I'm gonna use a very thin line here to follow that, that crack that's going through the ice all the way across the page. I'll include that. And I'll also include that there's a little bit of a, uh, of a gap between the ice and the water here because the water is darker than the ice, obviously. So I can go ahead, I'll grab my other pencil really quick for this because it's already blunted. And I'll just fill this in. I'll make um, tiny little circles like this to just shade in. And this is where the ice meets the water, right in this little corner. Now, another thing, um, just to kind of do a little house, housekeeping, I'm gonna remove this middle line, okay, with my eraser, <sighs> okay, so that I don't have uh, any more marks than I need. Now let's talk about uh, the mountains, okay? Because the trees are gonna take the most amount of time, okay? So let's, let's just knock the mountains out first. The mountains have trees on them. Uh, well, at least this one does. So in order to get trees, quote unquote trees, on your mountain, what you're gonna do is you're gonna start by just creating a, a kind of a Richter scale looking line. Okay, and I have a lot of space, a lot of white space between these trees. They're not, um, they're not really trees even. They're just a squiggly line that kind of looks like you're, you're getting an earthquake reading on a Richter scale coming up the mountain. And I'm not, th these are not connected. Okay, there is white space between them. And that's what's going to help to create the right illusion. Okay, because you can do this a couple of times. Okay, just like this. And that's gonna to help to create a wonderful optical illusion of trees on the mountain, okay? Funnily enough, that's how we're also gonna create our tree line. But not all of the mountains have trees. So for the ones that don't, I'm just gonna go ahead with a nice fine tip pencil, and I want this to be a thinner line, but I want it to be solid. And I'm going to just notice where the, pe the peaks uh, or the, the, the rocks create these tiny little peaks on the mountain, okay? You wanna have some character. You don't want it to just be a dome or a pyramid. You wanna have some rocks and you wanna start seeing maybe, oh, some trees come down the backside of this mountain now. This one has a little bit of a sharp point to it. So this is a cliff, okay? So I'm just gonna go ahead and walk my way tracing all the way over there. And we also have snow. So the way to draw snow, very simply, is that you don't draw it. You draw everything but the snow and the white of the page will be the snow. So I'm just gonna create these outlines, see how the, in between this, these two peaks here, we have this little valley that's filled with snow. Okay, so everything that's gonna have snow is just gonna be a blank page. And I'll go ahead and I'll use my pencil to sort of shade in. what the rock is. Okay. And of course, we're gonna have variations of, of light, right, within this area, because it's, it's definitely in a, in a shadowy space. So instead of shading that in, what I'm gonna do instead is I'm gonna just go ahead and I'm gonna look and see how the mountain grew. I'm gonna look at the way that the mountain face is shaped. And based on what I'm seeing, there's, there's this valley, okay? There's this valley that starts all the way at the top where the snow is. And I'm gonna make these tiny little dashes, these tiny little lines to convey that. And I want them to swoop in. So like, it, like the letter U, like you're gonna make the letter U across the mountain and then you're gonna make it like that. You're going to make it bend in and out, in and out, in and out. Just like that. And I'm using dots or dashes because I don't want, I, I still want it to be light like snow, but I want it to have some form of texture there. So that's what I'm going to do with that. Now for this other mountain, if you look very closely, you're going to see 
that there is another tree line. Okay, like above this elevation, the trees stop growing. So what you can do is you can take your sharp pencil again and, and get that Richter scale going. And if you're afraid of smudging your work, you just take a piece of scrap paper here and uh, put it down on top of the paper to protect your work from being smudged by your hand. Okay, and this is going to give you a nice tree line. Okay, keep the white space in between. You know, don't make it just one line that's connected. That space that's, that's presenting in between each little dash there, that airiness is very important. Okay, the mountain is one continuous line. The trees, however, are many little uh, W's or M's, and that creates a nice optical illusion. Okay. So there we have a, a nice beginning, because we're going to focus on this tree line next. It's going to take a little bit more work, but we'll get there. Now, regarding the tree line, we have a pretty easy job up to this point, right? So we can continue with our formula that's worked all along of, of that, that sort of Richter scale. I'd say about up to here, right? So I'll go ahead and I'll, and I'll make this a little bit more exaggerated because it's closer to the camera. But we're gonna have to do a, a little bit more work to make these feel like trees when it gets closer to the camera. Okay, that's, that's where we're going to learn a little bit more about making trees. And you know what? I'm just going to add one more of these tree lines here to just fill in that blank space. You know what? Maybe I want an eagle or something flying up high. There we go. A little creative license there. Okay. So now let's talk about these trees. Now, um, we're going we're gonna to build these. Right, so let's let's keep that that term build on the tip of our tongue here, because it's not going to be like uh, what we're doing with the Richter scales. We're actually going to have to follow a construction method. So let's go ahead all the way to the right hand side of the page, the left hand side of the page, and I'm going to mark. Um, I'm just going to get rid of that really bold tick mark there because it's bothering me. Okay, we're going to mark the top of the tree with a dot. And we're gonna see that uh, we're, we're gonna run into pretty much um, you have the background trees and then you have the foreground, foreground trees. So we're gonna do the top halves of the background trees first. So what I'm gonna do is I'm not gonna just draw a stick and I'm not gonna just begin by, uh, you know, and I, I make this example a lot. So bear with me if you've seen this before. A lot of the times people will go ahead and start like this and then they'll start doing their trees kind of like that and it's just not going to work. Similar to that Richter scale line where you're leaving white space in between, you're going to want to leave a lot of white space at the beginning of your tree and you're going you're gonna to make these very strategic marks that look very vague and disconnected at first, but you're giving yourself, again, a structure to build on top of. That's why I said we're building these trees. And we're, again, approaching it from the perspective of the architect, right? We're noticing that the outer side of the tree first is what's going to give us the uh, ability to come inward, right, and add additional information. You know, we have these areas where the trunk is visible. We have areas where the trunk is bare, but it's also um, areas where it's totally covered. So you don't want to see the trunk of the tree all the way through because it's going to be covered with foliage. You want to see it every once in a while like this. Just give yourself some opportunity to exploit the fact that you don't have to work as hard as you think you do. Okay, so this is a much more efficient way of drawing a tree than what we've typically tried to do in the past, you know? We're building it like an architect on the outside, letting the airy space suggest density, right? These trees could, this could look like a snowy tree. It could look like a full tree. You know, that it, it's all about the context in which the tree is situated. So let's take that idea and apply it to our drawing. So 
here's a here's a fun one. The tree all the way on the left is kind of bare. Maybe it's dead. You know, it's not. It's skinny. In this situation, go ahead and draw the 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 trunk first. That's okay, because that's a skinny dead tree. Now, when you're doing the foliage, however, leave room like this, like the the branches, those bar those barren branches. Okay, I'm letting them alternate. I'm not really focusing too much on getting every single one in there. I'm just kind of creating these skeleton-esque looking branches before running into the foregr foreground trees, which we'll get to in due time. Now this tree's neighbor is a little bit more full, so I'll draw the top of that one, draw the where it meets the foreground tree, and I'll go ahead and I'll start to do what, exactly what I did on the scrap paper. I'll leave space in the middle, and I'll only work on the outside using very simple mark making, dots and dashes. Okay, and that's gonna allow me to build my tree accurately. Okay, so we have a section of trunk that's visible, then it disappears, then it gets visible again. Okay. And now it crashes into that little bottom layer right here. We're gonna have a, a bunch of foreground trees. So we're gonna stop. Okay, so moving right along, we're gonna head over here. We got a taller looking tree right over here. So let's go ahead and start with this one. This one's about a little bit taller, but it's thinner. Let's keep it narrow. Nice and narrow, but full. Okay, we're making dots, we're making dashes. We're just using mark making as our method here. Very simple. And the tree, okay. trunk is like a nice pole. Good like ship mast. Okay, and if you want, you can get rid of some of the some of the extra noise in there. I know we threw down a lot of dots earlier in our planning process. They all don't need to be there. Okay. Cool. And we're gonna work our way across the page just like that. Okay, and I'm covering up my 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 picture so that I don't smudge it with my hand. Okay, I'm gonna make a dot on the top of the tree, a dot for where the tree disappears behind the foliage, and I'm just gonna work my way down again on the outside, a sharper pencil, just letting it breathe. You want air in between your, your marks. Because the brain is a very interesting thing. It kind of completes the sentence for you, visually speaking. So even though you're not drawing every stick and, tr and tree and, and branch, the way in which this works is that your mind will fill in the gaps, reducing your workload tremendously. Okay, we have a shorter tree right around here. You have that sun, that little sunbeam coming down. We're just gonna ignore that for right now. Just gonna get our tree in there. Great, great, great. Making good time. Got about a half hour left, so we're gonna, I'm gonna try to sprint through this so that we can get to the last exercise of the day. Okay, so don't worry if you're, if you're not keeping up with me, that's fine. Again, we recorded this workshop so you can rewatch it and draw at your own pace, that's fine. And I'll also be sending you my finished drawings so that you can have a nice reference, okay? So I'm just gonna go ahead and use this uh, approach to fill in the rest, okay? Got this nice skinny one here for that. Getting all the sunlight, okay.
just like that. Okay. And we're walking our way across the left-hand side of the page. Trees are now starting to get shorter. They're not pushing up above the mountain peak here, as you can see. And now, because the trees are further away, they're smaller, it's gonna take less time to do, and it could be a little bit less uh, particular with your mark making. It's always good to, to maintain a high level of, of uh, diligence, but once you get further away into the background, you, you get to relax a little bit. So I'm gonna make a natural border here because I mentioned that there's these um, trees in the foreground. Where the trees meet the dirt, I'm gonna start to just kind of walk my way from left to right. It disappears as you get further away. Uh, but this is where those, litter, those smaller trees are gonna grow in front of the bigger ones. Okay, and I'm not gonna worry so much about the nitty gritty details inside of them. I'm just gonna go ahead and get this part of the page filled up. Okay, we got some snow laying on the ground. We have some rocks. You know, there's a lot of interesting features and textures we can add. But since we're, we're on a tight timeline for today, not gonna get so focused and wrapped up in that. We also have some different types of trees growing on the perimeter over here. So those trees are, are, are um, probably gonna be a, uh, maybe a swamp oak or some type of a, a sycamore or a, a cherry or something like that. Those, those trees tend to grow in soil that is very, um, that is not oxygen rich. So that means that they like, places close to water. So for these, I'm gonna go ahead and do exactly what I did with those other trees, except I'm gonna go ahead and, and think about them as a cluster. So I'm not just gonna worry about drawing one, I'm gonna draw the whole cluster. And I'm gonna draw the border between those, those clusters and the last spruce tree. And I'm making my way to the spruce tree now. So this is the one I'm gonna draw from top to bottom. A nice sharp pencil again. I want it to be a nice rich line, very sharp, and I want to see where the trunk hits the ground. That's a, that's a big deal. Okay, and these trees tend to get a little bit more um, barren towards the bottom because they're not getting the sunlight they need, so they'll just shed those leaves. And I'll think about also the border here. Okay, so I have these tree trunks kind of coming up and leaning into each other. And I'm not really following any rhyme or reason other than the, the fact that they're far away and that they're sort of creating a pattern to follow. Okay, and we'll have that nice tree line. There we go. Make this tree a little bit more defined there. Good, 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 good. And on the far shore, there's also a line where the, the forest meets the land. So I'm just gonna use a very thin line and I'm not gonna worry so much about filling in all the details with uh, you know, the tree trunks and stuff. That's, that's all for the foreground. Remember that idea of visual hierarchy. Okay, so we have these little bushes in the foreground here, maybe some, some logs. You can add stuff that isn't in the picture as well. Like if you want to add like a cool rock, something to jump off of in the summertime. It's probably too cold to swim in this lake now. But you can add little features like that to bring the foreground to life. Meanwhile, over here in the background, Lots and lots of mark making. <laughs> so although landscapes are, for the most part, easy to draw, you can make them as difficult or as easy as you want them, right? You can make these a project that takes hours and hours and hours, or if you only have 15 minute lunch break on your hike and your friends are trying to, you know, come on, what are you sitting there doing that for? Then you could just do a quick one. So it's up to you how much time you get to invest in these.
which is why when I'm not guiding, I usually, I walk, I go with somebody who doesn't care if I'm sitting in a single spot for 45 minutes at a time. I usually bring a, a little stove and some, some tea. And that way I could have the other person make tea and, and get comfortable while I'm sitting there drawing. Okay, so just filling in this little area. You can put a little cabin or you can fill in whatever you want there, Ferris wheel, whatever you want. <laughs> you know what, I kind of like the fact that these trees are tall, so I'm just gonna showcase the rest of them with their long trunks in the background. I like the way that feels. Maybe in between those trunks, I'll add these little, maybe, eight-year-old trees, six-year-old trees here, youngins. And again, leaving it airy and leaving it open is okay because your, your brain will fill in the rest automatically. Okay, so even if you leave these little areas blank, you add some like maybe some branches from other trees coming in, your brain's gonna fill in the rest of the picture, no problem. All righty, so that's landscape drawing. We have a new workshop on the calendar this month. At the end of the month, right before New Year's, we're gonna do a landscape drawing class. It's gonna be the first one that is entirely dedicated to landscape drawing. So if you enjoyed this and if you liked the way this felt, that's a good one to sign up for. And if you're more interested in the stuff that we did earlier with the, uh, the spruce, uh, the Douglas fir cone, we have a botanical drawing class where we focus on the, the science and the morphology of plants. Um, I think we're gonna be doing a poinsettia this month to stick with the holiday mood. And uh, we also have um, a nature journaling class, which I'll tell you about in a little bit because the next exercise we're about to do is going to be a field sketching exercise. So this is the kind of stuff that I like to do when I'm hiking. There you go. And um, the thing is, this next exercise that we're gonna do, it is very rapid sketching. We're not going for accuracy. Instead, we're gonna take on the persona of like, let's say a, a, a reporter, right? So you wanna be able to document as much information as possible as a reporter, because when we sit and we try to render things as accurately as we can, you know, we, we sometimes miss the important pieces of information. And like we did with our, our Douglas for, uh, first sketch earlier, we created a sort of field report with our artwork. Now, taking that to the next level, you're gonna sacrifice your art quality a little bit because the data is the priority there. So we're gonna teach you I'm going to teach you really quick some of the techniques you can use to, um, here's our landscape, uh, some of the techniques you can use to um, capture as much information about the place you're hiking in as possible, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you again. Here we are. This is the nature journaling stuff I was just telling you about. Again, data, data, data. We're, we're thinking about it like reporters, okay? We're gonna pull in as much information as we possibly can in order to make our sketchbooks or our nature journals as um, beautiful and as uh, informationally dense as possible. So <clears throat> here we have this concept, draw, write, and quantify. So earlier on in the class, we had our Douglas fir cone. Okay, so we drew the cone and by drawing it, we were forcing ourselves to focus on the details, to stay in the moment and to pay close attention to what's going on with this cone. Then we wrote down some notes, right? We added our location, the date, we talked about what trail we were on, and then we started quantifying it by adding numbers, by adding measurements and things like that. So this is particularly something we concentrate on in our botanical drawing class. And as you can see in the right-hand part of the slide, this is a botanical drawing of the American black cherry. Here we've displayed not only the leaf and the foliage, we're showing the reproductive structures. We're seeing that 
it's a um, a um, monoecious plant, meaning it has uh, it's a unisex plant where it has male and female flowers. And we're looking at it uh, from the point of what does its fruit look like? What do the, um, the sprouting leaves look like? That we can always do at home. For the stuff in the field where we're training our mind to develop our visual and sensory learning skills, we're gonna be drawing very rapidly. And that would look something like this, okay? So this is an example from our last nature journaling class of um, just an observation of a tree profile. Picking one single tree and putting all of your attention into what's happening on that tree, right? So as you can see on the right-hand side, that's a very busy tree. We have a white birch tree. Uh, we're doing a little highlight drawing of what the leaf is. We're looking at the bark and we're noticing that there's little holes drilled in the bark and we're asking questions as we're making observations. What bird could do that? You know, is that an insect or a bird that drilled the holes? There's a bird's nest. Who's in the bird's test nest? And you know, how tall is the tree, so to speak, and so on and so forth. So this is going to kind of manifest like this. We're gonna, we're gonna start by squaring off our page and we're gonna draw a line vertically and a line horizontally so that we have these four thumbnails, okay? And we're gonna play a game. I'm gonna share a video clip with you. And that video clip is only gonna be on the screen for about 20 seconds. Okay, 30 seconds, I'll be generous. It'll be on the screen for 30 seconds. And what you'll have to do is you'll have to have your pencil and paper on the table, you're not allowed to draw. You're only allowed to watch for 30 seconds. Then I'm gonna take the video off the, off the screen and from memory, you're gonna jot down your observations. Okay, these are um, maybe little rapid sketches or notes. It can look very cartoony, that's totally fine. Again, we're thinking like reporters, we're thinking like data sponges. We wanna absorb as much information as possible. So to prepare for this, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my page and I'm gonna to go to the back end side of the page. It's, it's kinda of cool when you look at what we've done in the class so far all on one piece of paper. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just fold it back the opposite way and use the, the end of the page here. And to keep my stuff from smudging, I'm just gonna insert a piece of scrap paper in between because pencil can smudge. And again, just like with our other exercise, we're gonna start with a margin around the page. And this is the way we're gonna use this tool. We're gonna divide our one rectangle into four rectangles. And if you go on a hike and you bring your nature journal with you and you set up the pages in your nature journal like this in advance, what you're gonna wind up doing is you're gonna be collecting tons and tons of these little thumbnail drawings so that by the time you get home, you almost have like a sequential story of, of what you've seen you know, throughout your hike. So let's just, just really quick, I'm gonna pull something out of memory. So I'm on a trail, we're hiking together, and we come into this beautiful little clearing. Let's say it's a swamp pond. So I'm gonna go ahead and we, we see some tall grass here and we see a little lake or a pond surrounded by trees. We have, uh, let's say we have birch and uh, what other trees? Let's say we have birch and swamp oak. Okay, and that's gonna be the kinds of trees that we see surrounding the lake, okay. And we have the path, let's say, let's go ahead and say path. And we're gonna add little arrows as to where we're walking. Oh, and by the way, we see a, a great blue heron. Maybe he's right here. I always use this bird in the example. So whenever I post pictures from nature journaling, it's like I'm, I have a, an obsession with these birds, but really it's just because they're super easy to draw and explain. Blue heron. Fishing. So what kind of fish? Okay, um, you can ask questions like, um, for example, if there's something in the background like a mountain, what mountain? Or if you know the name of the mountain, you could write that name down. And we're just rapidly adding information, tall grass, maybe there's turtles in there, or frogs. 
And then that, that feeds into, well, is the blue heron fishing for fish or is it hunting turtles or frogs? And you can see how this sort of weaves a nice com complex conversation within a, a square that's only a few inches, right? So you're maximizing the use of your page, but you're also going to be adding a ton of information to it. And, and I'll show you how to bring it all together into something more cohesive in just a minute. But for now, pencils and erasers down, hands on your lap. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to put 30 seconds on the clock. And I'm going to share with you a quick video. All right. So we're going to begin this exercise in three, two, one, zero. Okay. So what are we seeing here? Okay, we have a beautiful snowy landscape, deep snow, a lot of tracks in the snow. What are these trees? They, they're so covered in snow. And, and what are these mountains in the background? It's a clear blue day. I wonder what the temperature is. You know, is it windy or is it still? That's something to write down too, environmental conditions, right? And just like that, 30 seconds is over. What did you see? So I'm gonna stop the screen share really quick so I can kind of participate in this with you. Now, based on those observations, what we're gonna do is, okay, there's a lot of information there. I see right on the top, we have clear skies. No wind. Okay, we have snow covered, let's say they're fir trees. Okay, we also have um, some mountains in the background. Okay, so uh, let me go ahead and it looked like there was a path that kind of came off. So let's go ahead and say path or trail. Looked like it was heading this way and here's another one that's going this way. And we have the trees. Remember that little Richter scale line? Well, it comes in handy when you're just trying to quickly get as much information down as possible, but we have these mountains in the background. How tall, right? And, and just pulling this stuff together really quickly, and I'll share my screen with you again before we do the next one, is quite a nice, oops, here we go. Quite a nice uh, collection of questions, right? But well, what kind of trees are these? Are there any tracks in the snow? And if you look, yes, there are tracks. What kind of animals are, are, are making these tracks? Who lives up here? Maybe they're fox, or they're raccoon, or they're squirrel, or maybe rabbit. How deep is the snow for that matter? What's the elevation of the surrounding peaks? These are the kinds of questions that, and, and I really like to, to use the term naturalist, that naturalists have. It's a naturalist mindset because you're thinking beyond the experience that you're having. You're thinking about the experience that you're now walking into. Because there's life here, whether you're, whether you're in this situation or not. You know, there's, there's a community, a nature community here that you're now walking into and you're seeing signs of. So what are the most interesting signs? Like I'm really interested in footprints. It's one of my favorite things about hiking in the winter. What types of animal tracks are we seeing? Who's awake right now? That asks what hibernates and what doesn't, right? We're not gonna see bear tracks up here in the winter time, but yeah, we're definitely probably gonna see rabbit and fox. We're probably gonna see squirrel, maybe chipmunk or, or um, even mouse tracks, bird tracks even, you know? And, and we're just pulling, I even see snowmobile tracks. Like who's the guy on the snowmobile, right? So let's try this again. All right, and before we consider the ideas that, that are on this page, I want you to, to actually draw as you're watching the video next time, right? So I'm gonna play another video for you, okay? And this time I want you to actively sketch and write down questions and pull together your, your, your naturalist uh, mind with your artist mind and uh, get it down on the paper, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and make a, a full minute available for us to do this. And I'm gonna have to loop the video clip. I wish I could take you all hiking, but video clips is the best I can do in this virtual uh, space. And just get busy and don't worry about it looking like a beautiful finished work of art. Just get the information down on the page. 
right? We're gonna start that in three, two, one, begin. So you hear the snowfall. It's actually snowing, raining. Footprints, we have a, a tree line here. What kind of trees? Some of them still have foliage, that's interesting. Okay, and we'll keep looping this until the, the minute's up. Trail goes in one direction. Tracks, mostly human and dog. Um, okay, what else do we have here? We have some, uh, looks like some oak trees in the front. We have some oak, uh, maybe even some, maybe some birch or elm. That looks like a birch. So we're pulling together the types of trees that we're seeing, birch, elm, let's say sugar maple. And that's a full minute. That's just a quick minute observation here. And, you know, I'm going to quickly share my top down camera. When you string together these little mini miniature narratives of the scenes that you're coming across, again, it doesn't have to be so complex, but like, you know, say for example, we're, we're hanging out on um, near a, uh, an, an ocean, even you can do this at the beach. So let's say for example, you have an ocean, and then there's the this island in the background. And you could see that there's some vegetation on that island far away, right? We have the seashore right here. We see crabs. We see, um, what are those little sands? Sand lice, I guess. What are those little things? They, they kind of bury, really, bury themselves really quick. I don't know, sand lice, why not? We have the horizon line. Maybe there's a bigger island. Hey, you know what? We're in Hawaii. Maybe that's another island. That's Kauai in the background, maybe. Okay. What kind of trees? Maybe maybe we find some coconut. Okay. Maybe we can see some dolphins. Uh, we have a beautiful sunny day, so we can go ahead and see that with uh, minim minimal clouds. Maybe the temperature is, I don't know, 80 degrees Fahrenheit with a breeze. Now, I know these are all different environments. We, have, we had a snowy mountain. We had a rainy forest with snow and, and, and like two imaginary settings. But let's say this is all something that was done on the same hike. In order to tie this narrative together, we're going to look back to the first thing that we did which was our Douglas fir drawing, right? We had our timestamp and our location, and then we had our miscellaneous notes. But these two elements, the timestamp and the location, is what's going to help bring all of these randomized drawings together, essentially, into a more cohesive narrative. So, you know, <laughs> planet Earth, I know it's really vague, but... So let's say this is a this is a location we were we were hiking on, on um, in the Adirondacks in the Cle in the Keene Valley of New York, and we went on uh, the trail up to uh, Rooster Comb Mountain. And if we did this, you know, spent about two minutes per sketch. Imagine what you would come up with in three hours, right? If you were actively out there making these kinds of observations, and you're tying them all together into a single narrative by giving a date and a location maybe adding a weather report to it. And now you're, you're, you're giving yourself a very full and, and deep, rich nature experience that you would otherwise just walk right past, okay? So that being said, let's go ahead and finish up the class, make some announcements, okay? So let me share the screen with you one more time. So, how do you keep inspired, right? Obviously making hiking or nature meditation or spending time outdoors is a great way to start, but it's only part of the puzzle. Like in order to keep that intention and focus, you gotta have that interest. You gotta have that, that ability to, to pause and, and to really hone in on certain details. And 
if there are things that interest you, for example, botany, entomology, um, you name it, read up on it and become sort of like a subject matter expert, an unofficial subject matter expert on those things that make you excited to be outdoors. And that'll put you in a position to not only get excited about it, but to learn more and to teach people what you've learned through your art. All of these things can be kept in a nice, inexpensive nature journal. And this is, a, this is something that we talk about in our nature journaling class, um, but it's, a, it's always great to keep your mind uh, and, and, and your um, enthusiasm engaged. And uh, one fun thing that we have that, you know, I, I like to recommend a book every time I do a class. I just read this book because it's the holiday season. So I felt like the title was apropos. My Family and Other Animals by Gerald Durrell. And it's a story of a young naturalist and his family uh, on the Greek island of Corfu. And it's a good TV show too. Um, I just finished the book. It was adorable. It was really funny. Books don't typically make me laugh out loud, but this one did. But it was just inspiring to see this kid's enthusiasm for the natural world. And that's why I wanted to share that with you today. Um, speaking of sharing with people, there is a wonderful online community that we have. It's the Hike and Draw Facebook group. And the difference between a Facebook group and a Facebook page is that this is actually a community. This is a place where people like you and me share our art with each other. We engage in conversation. I offer discounts to workshops there. I provide downloadable resources. And we even have a monthly social gathering where we just get together and draw for fun. So that's on Facebook. If you're on Facebook, go to facebook.com slash groups slash hike and draw. And that's a great way for you to keep engaged and to share your work and the things that you're excited about with the rest of us. If you're interested in some of the other workshops, I know it's a, it's a holiday month, so we don't have as many as we usually do. Um, yeah, we have the community live draw social next week. We also have a botanical drawing class that's happening on the 21st. And uh, we have our first ever landscape drawing intro class on the 30th. Okay, so that's just before New Year's. I know it's a busy holiday season. I know it's a crazy time. Everybody's always uh, stressed out. This is a great way to decompress and to get away from all that. Also, if you're thinking about any last minute gift ideas, I'm, I'm putting this together. You can gift somebody a workshop. What we do is um, I'm gonna send you this PDF in your email. You can click the hyperlink in the PDF and that'll bring you to a form. If you want, you, we, we, we can include the name of the person it's for. We can put your name in it, make a nice little digital card for them. With a, with a special code that'll give them access to whatever workshop they want. So that's something new. It's not on the website because I haven't figured out how to build it there yet, but we're gonna do it this way. Also, if you're looking for a nice nature journal, this is the kind I use. A company called Rustico out of Utah makes these really wonderful uh, hardy journals. As a wilderness guide, my gear takes a beating, so I need a book that can be tough enough to withstand all kinds of uh, unpleasant weather situations and things like that out in the woods. So that's why I like this book. It's tough. It has good drawing material inside. And uh, if you type in Hike and Draw 2020 at checkout, you get a 15% discount. All right. Thank you all so, so much. This has been an absolute pleasure. I'm glad that we had so many people from so many different parts of the world here today. If you enjoyed yourself, please feel free to leave a tip. There's my Venmo handle. And I hope to see you all again really, really soon. Thank you very much. James, this was phenomenal. Thank you so much. Thank you, James. Great Thanks. to see so many from California. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank oh, you nice so much. You I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. James, would we find your January schedule on your website? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm still building January, but uh, I have it on the, um, on the Eventbrite page so we can. Um, Basically, if you go to the Eventbrite Hike and Draw page, I started putting the January dates up there. So, and I have an email that I sent out earlier in the month, uh, and there's a code in that email that you'd want to apply before signing up for those, okay? So, Thank and I'll you. share that with everybody else too. All right, everybody? Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. Have a great holiday. Great yeah. holiday. Yes, Thank have you. a happy holiday, everybody. Cheers. You too. Cheers. Bye. Thank oh. you.